How was that one? Okay. I'll turn this off to save the battery, even though it doesn't work. Our text this evening is found in the 20th chapter of Acts. Acts chapter 20, from verse 17 to the end of that chapter. And we read the words in Jesus' name. And from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, Ye know, from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations, which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life, life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy, and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus, to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And now, behold, I know that ye all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, shall see my face no more. Wherefore I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock, over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember, that by the space of three years I ceased not to warn every one night and day with tears. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. Yea, ye yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities and to them that were with me. I have showed you all things, how that so laboring you ought to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had thus spoken, he kneeled down and prayed with them. And they all wept sore and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing most of all for the words which he spake, that they should see his face no more. And they accompanied him unto the ship. Amen. This morning I spoke the, from the epistle text for this Sunday, which is the last chapter of Paul's letter to the, the church in Thessalonica. And it is also a farewell message. And woven in that message of the farewell to the church there, he he spoke or wrote unto them about Jesus' return, something that troubled the church in Thessalonica, the eminence of his, turn, of his return, but yet that they would wait patiently on the Lord's return. He did not leave them alone, as Paul does not leave these Ephesian elders alone, but points them to Jesus Christ, which would be the central point of any text that we would read from in the Bible. Paul was returning to his home base, you might say, on his third missionary journey. And he had traveled from Mytilene in verse 14, just prior to our text. He was sailing down to uh, Miletus, 
Mytilene, or Mytilene, however you would say that, is an island, and he was going across to the mainland there of Asia Minor to Miletus. Ephesus was a few miles up the coast, and he did not have time to go there, although it was his desire to speak to the children there in Ephesus, even as we see the method of Paul in the 15th chapter of Acts, speaking unto his uh, brother Barnabas, some days again, or some days after, Paul said unto Barnabas, let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they do. It was no different here. Paul desired to visit with the people there, the, the children of God in Ephesus, but he did not have the time as he was returning to Jerusalem. But he sent for the elders of the church, the, um, the overseers, the bishops, another way that is this word is translated in the Bible, the elders of the church. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, Ye know, from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons. Prior to this, in the, in the book of, um, in, in Acts here, we see how he began his third missionary journey and he went to Ephesus and how he um, spoke with them in the, for the space of three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. I don't think it took Paul too long whenever he was in a locale before he would begin to speak to them about Jesus. We sometimes get caught up in small talk and if nothing else, we'll talk about the weather for quite a few minutes when we greet one another. And it may have been that way for Paul, but it seems so often as we follow him through the book of Acts that, that as it was his main purpose, of course, being called of God to, as an apostle, not in the will of man, not by man, but by Jesus Christ, the Father which has risen him from the dead, that he would preach the word of God in all seasons or all times, in inopportune as well as opportune times. He served the Lord with all humility of mind, Sometimes we may get the impression that Paul was a little boastful of his, of his um, ministry. Even as he, as he wrote that he labored more abundantly than the others, but nevertheless was the grace of God that was in him. That God called him to be worthy that he would be able to preach the word of the Lord. And he served the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and with temptations or trials, which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews. And if we would read on there in the book of Acts when Paul was there in Thessalonica, how it was, or Ephesus, excuse me, Ephesus, how difficult a time he had. As there were those who would always be dogging him, as it were, and trying to get him to not speak the word of the Lord. It's, a, it's really quite a parallel, not that we would compare Paul to the Lord himself, but how it was with Jesus also, as he always had those that were following after him, trying to shut his mouth. Whatever it took, they would try to silence the words of Jesus or to at least refute him and to negate his teaching and his preaching. The same with the Apostle Paul. And I'm sure it is the same even now. Whether we would have an outward persecution or whether there would be an inward struggle within the one who would be called to speak the word, that it is always and only by the grace of God that this word would go forth in its truth and in its power. Going on in verse 20, how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you. How he had spoken unto them the entire counsel of God. Of 
course, we did not have, they did not, excuse me, have the New Testament as we have it now. They had the scriptures, the Old Testament, even that which Jesus exhorted those who followed after him to search them, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. They testified of Jesus Christ. He kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house. If we look at the life of the apostle, even as he recounts it unto the, in the letter of the, uh, unto the Philippians, we see how he could boast, and he did boast in his prior life, of all that he was able to accomplish. A Pharisee of the Pharisees, of the tribe of Benjamin, concerning the law, blameless. These things which he could outwardly boast of. But it was not this that was profitable unto them. Even as he wrote unto the Romans in the 10th chapter, that his own people, his prayer, and his heart's desire for Israel is that they might be saved. They had a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. So the knowledge that they were lacking was the knowledge of salvation in Jesus Christ, even as he writes here, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. How he kept back nothing that was profitable, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house. Testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks. We remember how he wrote unto the Romans, the Roman epistle, that he has counted all, Jew and Greek, guilty. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And that's why then later on he would also write, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither male nor female. There is neither bond nor free. But we are all one in Jesus Christ. His message was probably a little different to the Jews than was to the Greeks because of their background, because of their knowledge of the scripture. But nonetheless, that they would all be brought, even as we would all be brought, to repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. Remember how it was with the apostle, how he would, he would preach quite often to the Jews. He would recount how God had been with them throughout their entire life as a people, their journey as a, the people of God, how God had called Abraham to lead him from his um, home in the east to the land which he had chosen for his own people. And how he had been with them as he drew them or guided them or led them out of the land of Egypt back to that promised land. And he gave unto them the, the covenants, the law, the promise. All of these things were given to the Jewish people as the children of God for our benefit even that we would be counted as a child of God as we are blessed with faithful Abraham. But it was a little bit different to the Greeks because they did not know the scriptures. He probably would try to, as we see a little bit, how he spoke to them in Athens on Mars Hill, how he would appeal to them through philosophies. But nonetheless, they would all be brought to that place of, as we see in verse 21, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. There is only one gospel. There is only one Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And there is only one Father, and there is only one way to him. As Jesus says, nobody, no one cometh unto the Father but by me. And there is one, there is man, and there is one God, and there is one mediator with God, Jesus Christ, uh, the righteous. Repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. The word tells us that um, godly sorrow works repentance not to be repented of. Repentance is a work of God. And I believe, as the, as the word tells us here, as it is closely connected to faith, that those who are called by God, those who God has worked in the heart, repentance a turning, a desire to turn from sin only comes from God, and that repentance is done in faith, looking unto him who is able to deliver us 
from it. As God works it in the heart, therefore it must be of faith, by God, of God, from God, and that faith would be centered then or focused upon Jesus Christ. That we have faith, but the object of our faith is Jesus. It is not just that we have faith in faith, but our faith is toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit. Now he's beginning to tell them of his trials, his temptations as an apostle of Jesus Christ. I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there. The next chapter in my Bible, I have a, a subtitle there, a subheading for chapter 21, Paul is warned about returning to Jerusalem. And we know what happened to Paul in Jerusalem as he was arrested and then brought back to Rome as he appealed unto Caesar. But it was necessary now that he would go to Jerusalem as he is bound in the spirit. As Paul would quite often speak of himself as a prisoner of Jesus Christ. How he did not go about establishing his own journeys or his own route, whatever it might be, but we see how he was led and he was bound now in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. This much he knew. The Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost uh, revealed unto him that, that bonds and afflictions abide me that those are the things which await the apostle. And he went, nonetheless. He went in faith, knowing that the Lord would deliver him, maybe not from it, but through it. And he would obedient, be obedient unto the call of the Lord. None of these things move me. Quite the statement there. None of these things move me. None of these things would alter the course. None of these things would, would uh, change his, his desire, even as he said that, woe unto me if I do not preach the gospel. None of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself. Reading these verses here, especially as as a minister of the gospel, I don't know how it is for you other speaking brothers, but I see very clearly here that Paul is on a different level than me. We see Paul as he establishes authority as one who was called by Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus, a very outward call into the apostleship and the authority that he had as an apostle as he was addressed directly by the Lord and Savior. So for that reason, we can see that he had a calling that was above a calling that would be um, prevalent or evident even now in a speaker. But yet there is something for us here. We can't totally say that, well, that word is for somebody else or it was applicable only for the Apostle Paul, but, but what about those who would preach the word now? Even as he instructs his brother Timothy, the young son in the faith, to preach the word, be instant, in season and out of season. And there are those who say that Timothy was a little timid. He wasn't an outgoing person like the apostle. And he needed that exhortation, that little bit of a push that he would continue and he would stay steadfast into that, in that into which he was called. So this does apply in that sense to those who would preach the word, the whole counsel of God, even now unto the children of God. Neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy. And the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Even this word ministry, we read that, we think of a minister or a ministry, and we, we think of preaching. 
But really what the word means is, is service. That he would be a servant. He is a servant of the Lord. In this course, he has received of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the instruction is that he would testify the gospel of the grace of God. The grace of God which is evidenced, made known in Jesus Christ. The law came by Moses, grace and truth in Jesus Christ. Would testify of the good news of the grace of God. And now I behold, or now behold, I know that ye all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, these are dear brothers to him, and more than friends, more than acquaintances, but they are, as he also wrote unto the Romans, heirs of God, joint heirs with Jesus Christ. We have been given the spirit of adoption. We are the children of God through the blood of Jesus Christ, which draws us together. We have been given that Holy Spirit, which calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the whole Christian church on earth and keeps it in union. That's who Paul is speaking to, and that's who I would be speaking to even tonight. Behold, I know that ye all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, shall see my face no more. Paul had a, um, what would I call it here, a premonition, maybe that's a wrong word, but that he, he would not be back to see his brothers there in Ephesus. History tells us otherwise, that after his, um, his uh, release from house arrest on the fourth missionary journey, he was able to go to Ephesus again, and he did, even as we read unto Timothy, that he um, left, would be left there in Ephesus. But at this point in time, he was knowing, if we look back there, um, to verse 23, say that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. That's what awaits him. Bonds, prison chains, shackles, and afflictions, difficulties, thrown into prison, thrown into jail, persecuting for his testimony of Jesus Christ. And because of that, he was sure that they shall see my face no more. Wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Because Paul had preached unto them repentance of, toward God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, he was then free or pure or innocent from the blood of all men. Again, it's not a, a boastful statement. For he preached the word of God, and faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. He was faithful to his calling, because he has not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Godly counsel, repentance, faith, and a sanctified life, as he also speaks of later in this chapter. Take heed therefore unto yourselves, and to all the flock. This is Brother John and I were just visiting a little bit before we spoke here about the words that Jesus gave unto uh, Peter, the Apostle Peter. Feed my sheep. Feed my lambs. Feed my sheep. And how Peter would later write then in his epistle, epistle to feed the flock of God among you, taking the oversight thereof. That we would feed the flock of God, not my flock, not anyone else's flock, not Pastor Ron's flock, Paul's, John's, anybody who labors here. It is God's flock. And I think that's something also that we as the ministers of the gospel would keep in the forefront of our, of our um, thinking and our, our approach to the word is that we would feed the flock. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. 
to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. I remember as a young person, it was my um, 15th birthday, and it was also Confirmation Sunday. We'd gone through the confirmation service, and my father, who was the confirmation um, instructor, the, the minister, reading from the altar book at the end of the, of the confirmation uh, um, service in the altar book, said that you are not your own. You have been dearly purchased. And as a 15-year-old who was looking ahead to all the, the um, great things in life, I was... I have to say that that's the only thing I remember from my Confirmation Sunday was that I am not my own, that I have been purchased. I have been bought with the blood of Jesus. And that speaks not only a, a wonderful promise that we have been redeemed, we have been repurchased by the blood of Jesus, not with silver nor with gold, but with the precious blood of Jesus. But it also lays upon those who have been purchased, who are of his flock, it gives them that responsibility as his children. The responsibility that doesn't differ that much from what Paul is exhorting the Ephesian elders to feed the flock, whatever flock you have or are in contact with. You as parents, Fathers and mothers, husbands and wives, as you teach your children well, as you raise them in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord, feeding the flock of God which is among you. All the way up then, if you would say it in that manner, to those who publicly proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. With that precious um, knowledge of being his child also comes that responsibility of pointing one another or another to Jesus Christ. For I know this, now a warning in verse 29, I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Peter tells us in his epistle that the devil goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And the devil has his minions. The devil has his mouthpieces. The devil has his servants that would go in among the flock and would tear the flock apart. And not only those from the outside, but also of your own selves. Verse 30. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. If you remember here a couple of weeks ago in, in Bible study, we were studying that in the epistle of John about the antichrists. Now there are many antichrists, those who would draw the children of God away from the pure and the holy and the precious name and the word of Jesus Christ. So there is a warning for these Ephesian elders that they would be aware of that. Through the revelation that God gave through the Holy Spirit to the apostle, that there would be those who would come in among them, not sparing the flock. Therefore, watch and remember, drawing them back to his diligence, that by the space of three years I ceased not to warn every one night and day with tears. And now, brethren, I commend you to God. He is placing them now in the care of God. He is not able to be with them anymore. And I suppose when we are able to still preach, teach, whether it's a congregation or whether it's our family, we feel that we have some ability or some responsibility, and rightly so. And I believe it is according to the word, even as Jesus told his disciples, that all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, 
And lo, I am with you all, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you that has been given unto us. But we do that as delivering that word of God unto the people. That word, that promise of the gospel has been done apart from us, but it needs to be delivered to the people. And that's what Paul is speaking of here now, that I am commending you to God. And how does God then deal with his people? John chapter 14, the words of Jesus. Chapter 14, um, verse 18. Well, wait, let's, let's start with verse 16. And I will pray the Father... And he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you. Jesus comes to us, he visits us through the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is evident there then in the preaching of Jesus Christ. We see how it all comes together in God's wonderful plan that through the foolishness of preaching that men would believe. But I commend you to God and to the word of his grace. God has not left us comfortless or as orphans but he has given the Holy Spirit which testifies of Jesus. I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. Able to build you up, strengthen, comfort you, console you in the midst of the the, the trials and the tribulations of life, As Jesus says, in this world you will have tribulations. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. And to give you an inheritance, an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, which fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you among all them which are sanctified, the departed saints. We are numbered with them through the Spirit which God has given, which proceeds from God. I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. Yea, ye yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities and to them that were with me. Paul was very careful within his missionary journeys that he would not lay any additional burdens on these young congregations, that they would have to somehow um, support him. But he was... He was um, supporting himself for the sake of the gospel within these new congregations. I have showed you all things, how that so laboring, ye ought to support the weak. And I think that is why my mind was brought to this text this afternoon as I was looking at the word because of the the words which were um, in the text this morning that I took from Thessalonians, as Paul wrote unto them. Um, Now, where is that? Verse 9, chapter 3, verse 9. Not because we have not power or, or authority. He speaks of his apostolic authority. But to make ourselves an example unto you to follow us. The example that Paul um laid forth there to the Thessalonians that he would labor for his own upkeep. Likewise, they should do it. As he went on and he spoke unto them that if you do not work, neither should you eat. Now he is using this also as an example. I have showed you all things, how that so laboring ye ought to support the weak. And to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. We see this consistency within the preaching and the teaching of the apostle as he first lays the groundwork, the foundation. No other foundation can any man lay than that which is already laid, and that foundation is Jesus Christ. 
First of all, the foundation of repentance toward God and faith toward Jesus Christ is laid, and it is relayed over and over again. Not a new foundation, but we are pointed back to it over and over again. We need to be reminded of where we have been taken from. We need to be reminded that our feet have been pulled out of that miry clay and we have been established or set upon a rock and God then establishes our goings. But in so doing then, we would labor as believers, as Christians, doing good works one to another to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. The teaching, the general teachings of Jesus, I guess, as it is very well known, this verse here that is quoted, these words of Jesus are found nowhere in the Gospels, but it is a general teaching of Jesus. The words of Jesus that had been propagated by those who would speak the word of the Lord in the early church, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had thus spoken, he kneeled down. Custom at that time was to stand while praying, but he kneeled. And it was a very emotional, um, um, what would you say, example or manifestation of his, of his um, feelings at that time as he kneeled down with them and prayed. And they all wept sore. This means they freely wept. They held back nothing and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him. I had a visit this afternoon just a little bit there about the the benefits that we have as Christians in touching one another. We spoke of the, of the beauty of the, of the greeting that we have when we speak to one another of God's peace and we shake each other's hands. And if we haven't seen anybody for a while, we might give them a hug. Even us as stoic Scandinavians, we might even go that far to give somebody a hug, a pat on the shoulder, a consoling um, a pat on the shoulder or a, or a hug when somebody is in need. And how wonderful it is when we experience that as the children of God, the closeness that we have one with another. These people, of course, were very demonstrative and they would fall on his neck. They actually hugged the apostle and they kissed him, souring most of all for the words which he spake that they should see his face no more. Isn't that interesting? And doesn't that show unto us the relationship that the children of God have one with another? He had not shunned to declare unto them the whole counsel of God as he repeated it again. Repentance toward God, faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ. You are the children of God. Now walk in it, in that life, in that new life which is in Christ Jesus. And it seemed as if they almost forgot about that And the only thing that they remembered was that they would see his face no more. And they accompanied him unto the ship. They walked with him all the way there to the the gangplank and they watched their beloved brother Paul go up into the ship knowing that they would see him no more. We don't know when we depart from one another if we will see each other anymore. I don't think any of us have ever been um, that well informed about the death of a loved one that we did know clearly that this is the last time that we would see them. This shows unto us the love of God which is manifest in Jesus Christ. It shows unto us the love that the apostle had for the church, the flock of God. And I pray, dear Father, that we would also have that same kind of love, one for another, and I trust that we do, that we desire to see one another. We desire to gather around his word. We desire to visit, to have fellowship one with another, to encourage one another on this walk which leads to eternal life. So we remember then our how are yous and things like that go much deeper than just 
um, a, a superficial thing, but it is the soul care that we have one for another. Even as Paul said, let us now go and see those places where we have preached to see how they are doing. May God comfort you and strengthen you in the gospel of Jesus Christ, knowing that even tonight your sin debt is forgiven in Jesus' name and in his blood. Amen. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. We'll close now with number 421.